And uh, the way that you find the length of a list is by wrapping it in this len function. And this handles all of the incrementing for you. It handles all of the bounds of the loop for you. Um, and then there's also the for each loop in Python. The for each loop, all we have to say is uh, for the elements in the data structure that you're looking for. So in this case, for instructor in instructors, you will be able to have access to the values of every single element in the list. And so the first one up here would print exactly what the second one uh, prints out, but the first one is an index for loop, the second one is a for each loop. And finally, we have uh, another traditional loop, a while loop, very standard, just like any other programming language. However, again, the main distinction is that uh, indentation actually matters in Python rather than what you'll see in languages like Java. So uh, functions, uh, a bit different, as well as we saw with variables, you don't have to specify types. It's the same thing with functions. So here, we don't have to specify what type this function returns. We just have to declare a function by using this def keyword with the function name and then the parameters. Same thing with the types. And then, just like usual, the return statement is the return keyword. Very, very standard stuff and nothing too crazy. Uh, we talked about the list data structure. So we talked about how Python uses lists. And so a very big thing that we want to touch on again is that lists are lists, they are not arrays. And what that means is that, you know, you're probably used to arrays. And so uh, arrays are fixed size. You can't really, you know, add things if it's beyond the, you know, size of the array. So Lists are much more flexible than arrays. They're a lot easier to work with and they're a lot easier to use. Uh, so these are some of the useful list functions we talked about. So if you want to add something to the end of a list, you use the append keyword, uh, the append function. You just add, you put in the parameter that you want to add. Uh, if you want to insert something at a certain location in a list, you just specify what location you want to insert the elements in. So in this case, if you want to insert at element at index zero, you can just specify that with the insert function. Uh, these lists have many different functions, including things like sort, etc. So lists in Python are very useful data structures that you'll use quite a bit. Um, and someone asks, so are lists like array lists in Java? Yes, uh, they are the list data structure rather than the array data structure. So uh, for those of you who are in CS125 right now that might be new to programming, you will learn how to use and implement a list in Java later in the semester. But for those of you who are already familiar with lists in Java, yes, this is very similar to the array list uh, in Java. So let's go ahead and get to the main content for today. Uh, that quick review is hopefully things that you should already know by now. Uh, Rohan went over it very nicely on Tuesday, and we've had a bit of practice with it in the homeworks if you've started that already. So today we're going to talk about, first, what is Pythonic code? And so Pythonic code is something that we want to touch on because it's really why you want to use Python over, you know, a language, another higher level language. So Pythonic code means that when you're writing code in Python, if it's Pythonic, it's not just correct code. It's not just code that compiles. It's not just code that is technically, syntactically correct. But it's also code that is writing Python in the way that Python is intended to be used. And so what does this mean? What is a good example of that? Well, in other words, Python is a really, really beautiful language. I know it's kind of weird to call a programming language beautiful. It sounds like I'm a nerd for saying it. But once you get more experience writing Python, you will see exactly what I mean. Python is a beautiful language, and it can allow you to write super clean, elegant, beautiful code in ways that you can't really see in other programming languages. And so this is what it means to be Pythonic. And so we'll have some examples here. So uh, stop simping over Python, show us what you mean. This is probably what you're thinking, and I will do exactly that. I will show you some examples. So let's see some examples. So let's say I want to find if an element exists in, a, in an array, if something is inside of an array. If I have an array of numbers, and I want to see, for example, if 5 is in that array. So let's see what this would look like in Java, for example. So 
Uh, in this case, we don't have numbers. Let's say we have an array of fruits. And I want to see if uh, this cherry string is inside of this list of fruits. So that's what we have right here. And let's say I want to update this Boolean flag found if I find it in the list. And so what we would do is we would have a for loop. We would loop through the length of the array. And once we find an element that is equal to cherries, then we'll uh, change found to true. Otherwise, it will stay false. Now, this isn't terrible. I mean, this is completely fine. If you were in Java, like this is how you would write the function very likely. But in Python, we can do this very beautifully. But first, let's see what it would look like if we directly translate it to Python. And this is something that I want you guys to kind of try to sway away from. Try to sway away from writing Java code in Python. Because there's, a lot of the time, a usually better way to write it in Python. It's usually, there's usually a Pythonic way of writing it. So here is what a direct translation from Java to Python would look like. You would just translate all these lists and then loop through. Once you found cherries, found is equal to true. So this is what it looks like. Um, but what does this look like Pythonically? How can we do better? How can we use Python in the way that it is intended to use? So here is the code. Um, let's say we have our list of fruits, apples, oranges, bananas, etc. What we can do is just simply say cherries in fruits. Which, is, which will return a Boolean value of whether or not cherries was found in fruits. And so this is a good example of what it means to be Pythonic. This is not really something that you'll find in many other programming languages. This is a very Python-specific feature. But it allows you to write very nice, beautiful, elegant code. Um, and so I could run this code for you, but I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, it'll just basically update found to true if it found it, and false if it didn't. In this case, found will be false because uh, cherries is not in fruits, not in this array at least. So this kind of idea allows us to enable, it enables us to write very readable, beautiful code that reads just like English. So here's an example of how we can utilize this idea of if something is in another language. So let's see. Uh, let's see if we can solve the question of if a hot dog is a sandwich. Uh, so this is a very controversial idea, and uh, there's a source that I've uh, been sent called cubrule.com that says that a hot dog is not a sandwich. Uh, but let's see, let's see how we can write this in Python. We can, we can have a, a list of sandwiches according to what cubrule says. And so we can say if hot dog in sandwiches rather than what we saw in Java, where we would have to loop through and actually say, well, if hot dog is at one point in this array, return true. We can actually, in Python, just say, if hot dog in sandwiches, return yes. Uh, a hot dog is a sandwich. Otherwise, according to a cube rule, it is a taco. So uh, this I can run this code, but it will just print out, according to cube rule, is it, it is a taco. If you are very passionate about this idea of uh, you know, if a hot dog is a sandwich or not. There, there is a link right here that you can read about. Uh, I'm not very passionate about the idea. I've gone down that rabbit hole way too many times. But if you're interested, there it is for you. So let's go through some more examples of what it means to be Pythonic and how to write Pythonic code. So first, we already saw the in keyword. Let's see some more things. So let's say I want to sum all of the numbers from 10 to 1,000. So like we said, in Java, you would just simply say, uh, let's have our starting number, our ending number, uh, and then a, a, a variable that will store the total sum of the values in between 10 to 1,000. And we'll just basically sum up all of those numbers. And uh, if we want that, that value, we can just print out total sum or return it in a function. So this isn't terrible, right? I mean, this looks fine. Uh, but how can we do better? If we wanted to write this in Python, is this what we should do? Should we just translate our Java code over to Python? Well, in this case, we shouldn't. Uh, we should actually utilize the features that are in Python. We can write this much more Pythonically. So what does this look like Pythonically? Well, in Python, we have, uh, you've already seen the range function. This is the range function that you would see in a for loop, where you say like for i in range of you know, some range. So the range function will give us the numbers from 10 to 1,000, uh, in this case, 1,001, because this is the upper bound, uh, non-inclusive. And so 
if you want to sum up the numbers from 10 to 1001, non-inclusive, uh, we just wrap it in a sum function, and this will give us the total sum. And so this is so much nicer to read in terms of English, in terms of elegance. This is what it means to be Pythonic. And this is the kind of code that we encourage you to write when you are writing Python. Uh, and I can execute this uh, here if you would like. Uh, you can. The slides are available. You will see that this will return the same thing that this would return. So here's some tips for writing Pythonic code. Um, Pythonic code isn't something that you'll be able to write from the first day that you learn Python, because there's a lot of ways to be Pythonic. And so um, here's my little tip for how to write Pythonic code. It's something that takes time. And so if there's something that sounds like you might need to lift your finger up just a little bit too far, uh, if there's something that, that sounds just too much for your uh, Python royalty, and you just cannot be bothered, then just simply Google what you want, and then you will likely see you know, a Pythonic way to do what you want. And over time, as you do this more and more, you'll find a lot of ways to become Pythonic, a lot of different tools and techniques to do this. So for example, if I wanted to find a way to uh, reverse a list, and so um, in Java, I'm sure all of you can imagine a way to reverse a list. You would have to you know, loop through things, store it in a new list, etc. Uh, but in Python, you would just simply Google it first, if you don't know how to, and you would find something like this. You would see that there's a very, very Pythonic way of doing it using slicing. Slicing is a concept that uh, Rohan taught in the first lecture. You can, you know, simply with just one line of code that is very readable, very understandable, reverse your list that originally looked like this into something like this. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to be Pythonic, and it'll take time, but this is how I recommend you go about becoming more Pythonic. And in this lecture, we will go through a couple concepts that will allow you to be Pythonic in your own code. Uh, let me go ahead and see if we have any questions. Um, so some people are asking if uh, I'm throwing shade on Java but not telling us the sum function. Well, you see, the point is, uh, it's not that Java doesn't have a sum function or something. It's just the combination of Python features, right? Uh, as far as I know, Java doesn't have a range function unless I'm missing something or I haven't written Java code in a while. Um, but it's just Pythonic code is just the idea that Python has a lot of unique features. And so using them in this kind of fashion to write cleaner, more elegant code, more readable code, uh, it's something that you can't really see in many other languages. Um, is there a reverse function? Um, I believe there is a reverse function, but I'm giving you very simple examples. There are many more examples that we will go through today. Um, so I believe we have a Kahoot question or no? Okay, we will start off by talking about list comprehensions. And then after that, we'll go ahead and start off with a couple Kahoot questions. So here's a concept called list comprehensions. This is one way of being Pythonic in your own code. So list comprehensions are a classic Pythonic tool. It allows you to create new lists from other lists, and it is basically reading like English. So let me show you exactly what I mean by first demonstrating you know, the functionality of what you would get out of a list comprehension without a list comprehension. So here is, what would it look like if we wanted to square every element in a list without having list comprehensions, which I haven't showed you yet, but just keep this idea in mind. First, I want to show you what it would look like to square every element in a list and store it in a new list. So first, I would have this list of numbers, so 3, 4, 6, 12, 16, and 25. And if I wanted to store all of the squares into this new list, I would loop through all of the numbers in my numbers list, and I would append the square of them in the squares list, and I would print out squares at the end. So, you know, this is without a list comprehension. This is a very non-Pythonic way of doing this. This is something that you could basically write in any programming language. However, let's make this Pythonic. So how can we do the same thing that we did in that code example that I have uh, down here, but in a Pythonic way? 
Uh, someone's asking, what is append? This is something that was covered in the first lecture. Append is how you add something to the end of a list. Um, so here is our example of list comprehensions up here. So let's say I have this list, the same list that we saw in the uh, example down here. And I want to have the same kind of behavior, but I want to be more Pythonic, more readable. What we can do is this idea of list comprehensions. And so here, how this reads is we will be outputting the square for every single number in the numbers array. And so what squares will print out here, I could run it if you would like, it will print out the squares of all of those numbers. So let me see if I can actually get this code snippet running for you. Um, let's see. So if I just execute this, you will see that we have all of the squares of the numbers that we have here in this new list that we generated using this list comprehension. So um, let's go ahead and get back into the slideshow. So how can you actually write a list comprehension yourself? Here is the general structure of a list comprehension demonstrated very nicely down here. So first things first, you want to have your output expression. So in this case, we want to square the numbers in the list. So our output, what will be going into the new list is this right here, the number squared. Then we will have our, um, in this case, like a for loop. So uh, we all know how to do a for loop, you know, for e in our list or whatever thing that you can iterate over. So that's this right here. And at the end here, we have an optional predicate or an optional conditional, which we will talk about in a little bit, but this part is optional. And so that's why you don't see it in this list comprehension example. And so this is a very nice way of being Pythonic to generate lists in Python. Um, let's see some more examples. So here is how we can supercharge our list comprehensions using conditional logic. So let's say I want to output all of the vowels in order in this list. I can go ahead and say, um, this is our output, the vowel. And so I want to loop through the sentence. So for vowel in sentence, if the vowel is in this string. So if I find a character in this string that is also in this string right here, then we can go ahead and add them to our output list, which will be the vowels array or sorry, list. Um, someone is asking, do the, do the outputs for list comprehension have to be stored in a list? As far as I know, yes, they, they are list comprehensions. Uh, so let me go ahead and show you guys what this code outputs um, in a compiler. So that way you can get a better idea. So here we have all of the vowels that we saw. So if you were you know, generating a new list, Based on the string right here, we would see that E is a vowel, O is a vowel, E is a vowel, A is a vowel, and so on and so forth, and put this in the output list. So uh, we can go ahead and show off another list comprehension here. Following the general structure, someone asked, why don't you need the um, star star 2 for this one? Well, uh, the star star. I'm not sure if Rohan would cover this in the first lecture, but the star star is how you square something in Python. So if I wanted to, for example, subtract two from every element in this list, I would just simply say n minus two here. Uh, the star star is not specific to list comprehensions. It is specific to how you square things in Python. So this is our output expression. Um, that's all it is. And so I hope this example in particular demonstrates how nicely readable these list comprehensions are. This essentially reads just like English. Uh, so let's go ahead and go through another example. So uh, we can have multiple loops as well. So uh, let's say I want to find the common numbers between list A and list B. Let's say I want to find the numbers that both of these share. So I can just go ahead and say, um, let's have two loops. Let's loop through uh, all the numbers in list A. And while I'm doing that, let's go through all the numbers in list B. And if the number in list A is equal to the number in list B, then let's put that in our output expression, which will go into our output list, our common num. And so we'll see that all of the output numbers, uh, all of the common numbers that they share will go into the output list. So these are two, three, and four, because they appear 
they occur in both lists. So uh, I hope all of these examples kind of give you an idea of how to put this structure into action. Someone asked in the Discord chat, is there any syntax for list comprehension? Yes, just follow this general structure down here. You want to have your output expression, just like we have here. You want to have your loop or multiple loops. And then you can have your optional cr uh, predicate, just like you see up here. Uh, following this general structure, it can help you write list comprehensions yourself. So someone said in the Twitch chat, I feel like this can get very convoluted really quickly if you have like five loops going on. This is completely correct, and this is actually something that I was going to talk about, but I might as well talk about it now. So as you can tell, I mean, this as is is approaching convoluted. So the whole point of using list comprehensions is to be elegant and to be readable in a way that sounds like English. But the moment that you guys get a little bit carried away with these list comprehensions, try to not do that. If there's something that's better off written not as a list comprehension uh, you know, in this way, just stray away from it because you want to write readable code, but you don't want to write convoluted code just for the sake of using these features. But you know, for example, something like this, I mean, this is a very elegant way of doing it, and this is how you want to, how you would want to write, um, you know, squaring every element in a list in Python. Same thing here, this is totally fine, and I would say this is totally fine as well. But have a limit to how convoluted that you get. Don't go too far, otherwise, you know, these list comprehensions can get very complex. Um, so let's go ahead and have a couple Kahoot questions. Uh, I'll show you guys the code right here and give you guys a couple minutes to join in. And feel free to ask any questions in the meantime. Someone asked me, how am I celebrating today? I'm celebrating by giving and preparing this lecture for you guys. Um, you accidentally capitalized the first letter of your net ID. Is that okay? You know, I'm actually not sure if that's okay. I think it's okay. Um, I, I'm pretty sure the way that we process the data, we make sure that casing is fine. Um... So, are there points for attendance? Yes, uh, this is your points for attendance. Yeah, the Kahoot, joining the Kahoot. Um, I am hella sleepy, it's like 5 a.m. Can I dip? Yes, you can dip. Uh, this is something we talked about in the first lecture. We have, pre we have the recordings of these up right after the lecture and to get credit, you just do the questions on Prairie Learn and you will get your attendance credit. Uh, can you check your overall grade yet? We are working on putting up a grade book, but for the most part, I mean, all the grades are up on Prairie Learn for the homework assignments. So uh, someone said the Prairie Learn attendance didn't come for the last time. I believe it did, but you might have missed the deadline because we only have the Prairie Learn attendances up until the next lecture. So it comes out pretty quick and then it expires like for in this case, like 30 minutes ago. Uh, so I believe it was there. You should have seen it. Uh, we, we just don't want to give you guys too much time on those because then you'll fall behind in lectures. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get the Kahoot started. We have two questions. Um, so to start, how can we check if an element exists in a list named names Pythonically? This should be very self-explanatory. The coot today should be very easy just to make sure that you guys are following along. If we do the Kahoot, do we need to do the attendance questions on Prairie Learn? 
This is like the age-old question in this course that we've been asked, I think, maybe like 70 times now. It's on the syllabus, and we've said it so many times. If you did the Kahoot, you don't need to do the attendance questions on Prairie Learn. The attendance questions on Prairie Learn are for the people that don't watch it live. There you go. That's the answer. If I have to answer it again, I'm gonna cry. Uh, happy birthday, thank you guys, thank you guys. Okay, well done to the 87 of you. Uh, so it seems like we have some people confused about this other trick question. Uh, while Python does read like English, uh, it's not this much like English. There is no such thing as is in. It's only if elements in the uh, iterable, such as a list. So, well done. Let's do one more question. Uh, so, what is the list comprehension for multiplying all elements in a list called nums by two? So... Uh, this is going to be similar to what I showed you guys on the slides. Uh, someone said, is in is a valid thing in Python? No, is is a valid keyword, and in is a valid keyword, but is in together, like to accomplish what we had in that last question, is not a thing. Um, is is a thing, in is a thing, but is in is not a thing. Okay. Uh, well done to the 83 of you. So we have some confusion with blue and yellow. So for blue, uh, this would be correct if it was not in the wrong structure. So if you guys remember, uh, this is the general structure where you want your output expression to the, to the furthest to the left. So here our output expression is all the way on the right. This is not okay. This is not how, it, how uh, list comprehensions will work. Um, down here, uh, no one chose that, thank God. But down here, a little bit confusing with the star star. So the star star is what I showed you guys on the slides. That was to square a number. But this question was asking for multiplying, which is just nums times two. Uh, okay. Doesn't look like we have any more questions. People are talking about how is in is valid in pandas. We were, we were just talking about native Python here, guys. Native Python keywords, so... We can talk about more libraries later on. Um, so let's continue. So another Pythonic tool, which is enumerate. And so what enumerate allows us to do is basically sometimes we want to assign an index to values in a list. And so this is what enumerate allows us to do. So let's say we have a list that has, let's say, values such as cars. We have Kia, Audi, and BMW. So let's say, you know, I want to have access to the indices and I want to assign every single one of these values an index, we can use enumerate. And so what this looks like would be, you know, zero, zero Kia, one Audi and two BMW. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So a common use case for this is in the context of for loops. So rather than, you know, what we showed off earlier with indexed for loops by saying for i in range of a list, you can actually, um, in this case, say for i, comma, the value, in enumerate, and then the list that you're trying to iterate over. Uh, so here, what this will give us is for each value in this list, we will assign it an index. We will assign it a value. So if we were to print out this uh, statement right here, we would get zero pizza, one kimchi, two ramen, etc. Is enumerate a function? Yes, it is. And that's actually something that we will talk about in this next slide. Um, yes, so no more questions about that. 
So yes, so enumerate is very useful with loops, but it doesn't always have to be in the context of a loop. So here, if I just wanted to, you know, pair an index with every value of a list, um, this is Pythonic because if you would imagine doing it not Pythonically, you would have like a for loop where you loop through all the values and have like an index counter and just basically pair them together that way. But in Python, enumerate does this for you. And so if you don't want to do it in the context of a list, uh, in, a, of a context, in the context of a loop, you can actually just use it just like this, enumerate foods. Uh, enumerate returns uh, what is called an, an enumerate object. So if you want to display it nicely, you would just want to uh, wrap it in a list just like this, a list type, cast it to a list, and you would get an output just like this. So I can show you guys what this looks like in the compiler. Uh, so first, if I just comment out this thing on the bottom here, and just execute this. So as you can see, um, we can just have for i comma food and enumerate food. So i will pair with the the left side of enumerate, which is the index, and food will pair with the right side of enumerate, which is the food. And so when we're printing it, we can just say print i comma food, and we'll get something just like this. And so someone asked a question about this one down here. This is showing off how enumerate doesn't always have to be in a loop. We can use it just as a... Um, as a function. And so you'll see the output right here. So people are asking, uh, are those tuples in a list? Yes, these right here with the parentheses are the tuple data structure. And uh, we have tuples in our homework. So the parentheses are the tuple data structure. I don't believe we've actually covered it, but tuples are very similar to lists, except they are not mutable. And, uh, other than that, I mean, they use parentheses instead of brackets, and those are the main distinctions between the two. And so enumerate returns tuples, uh, and so when we cast them into a list, we'll get a, a, a list of them. So that is what enumerate is. I hope that makes sense. Doesn't look like we have too many questions about it. Uh, someone asked if you, pre if you typed print enumerate, would that work? No, it wouldn't. It would give us, um, my parentheses are off here. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, so it would just give us this enumerate object at this memory address. That's why you want to cast it to a list. Uh, technically it compiles and everything, but uh, this is not really useful to print out. And someone asked, do you need to use enumerate as a loop to work? No, um, that, that's what this is showing off right here. Okay. Why are the parentheses in the output when you loop? Is because those are tuples, which I don't think we had time to cover in the first lecture. But as I said, tuples are just basically like lists, except they are not mutable and they use parentheses instead of brackets. So those are the main distinctions. Enumerate uses tuples. And I believe you will have some practice with tuples on the homework that we have released. So that is enumerate. People are asking, uh, won't lists already have indexes? Yes, lists will have indexes, but or indices, but this is how you would do it Pythonically um, with the enumerate function and you can pair them together very nicely at the same exact time. So I hope that clears up the questions about enumerate. Um, so that wraps up a lot of the part of the lecture that we're talking about Pythonic tools. So there are many ways to be Pythonic. Uh, like I said earlier, with more experience in the language, you will get better writing this elegant Pythonic code. Uh, but until then, just try to sway away from writing Java code in Python. Try to use the features that Python provides. And if you don't know what those features are, just kind of have the intuition, the you know push to when there's something that seems like there would be something for that in Python, just look it up. Say, you know, how do I reverse a list in Python Pythonically? And you will find the answer to your question. And over time, you will get something 
uh, you will get an, a better intuition for writing Pythonic code. So now that we are done covering kind of what Pythonic code is and how to write Pythonic code, let's learn some data structures. But first, we have a couple questions about the, the enumerate. Someone asked, why did the for loop print out a tuple and not the items in a tuple? That's because the tuple kind of pairs together those pair to, pairs together the index with the value rather than just print out the value itself. So if you have a list of values, enumerate will, for each value, pair it with an index, basically. Um, and they're stored in those tuples for every single value. OK. And someone asked, what objects are valid in print object? Uh, very large amounts of them. I can't tell you all of them. But most of the time, the print function in Python is very nice and will be able to print out what you would like without having to do much casting. So let's talk about our first data structure. So I say data structure because many of you, if you're especially if you're new to programming, you only know the array data structure. And now we've showed you the list data structure, which is very commonly used in Python. Uh, we will show you some new data structures, the first one being the set. And so what a set is, is it, it is an unordered and unindexed data structure, meaning that they don't have indices and they don't maintain the order of the things that you add to it. And each value is unique. So you won't have any duplicates when you store things in a set. So another feature is that it is very fast when you use it as a lookup table. This is something that we will talk about very briefly after some code examples. Uh, however, it does require some knowledge of things that aren't exactly taught yet. You will learn it later in 125 and definitely in CS225. And also these sets have functions in what you would see in like a math set. So you would have things like union, intersection, etc. So let's go through an example of a set in Python. And we'll run through how to, you know, interact with a set while we do it. So first things first, the way that you initialize an empty set is with this right here. You just say your variable is equal to set parentheses. And so it's the same thing that you would have with like a list, but in this case you have a set. And so the way that you add values to a set is you just do dot add with the value that you would like to add. Uh, very self-explanatory. But like we said earlier, sets do not have duplicates. So here, I've added one, three, four, and five into the set. But if I want to add three again into the set, we won't have that in our output twice. We will only have it once. So let me go ahead and show you guys what that would look like right now. So if I execute this and I print out what I've added into the list, you'll see that three only shows up once because sets do not have duplicates. Um, we can also cast to sets. So if I have a list here, with duplicates, I can cast it to a set, and you will see that all of the duplicates are removed, and it is now a set rather than a list. Um, we mentioned that, and the way that you cast it, of course, is by wrapping it with the type that you would like. So in this case, it's a set. Uh, we said that these sets are not ordered and they are not indexed. So the way that you would have to get values from the set, if you wanted to, is just by these normal for each loops. So if I wanted to print out all of the numbers in the set, I would just say for number in num set. And here you will see that we have one, three, four, and five. Um, that is the original set, of course. And so uh, another way to access elements is by saying, uh, if elements in the data structure, just like we did with lists. So if I want to check if four is in the set, we can just say if four in num set. And we will see that here, four is indeed inside of the set because we've initialized it with that value, or rather up here. Um, and another thing to mention is that lookups into sets, so checking if something is in a set, is much faster than lists. And we will talk about why a little bit right after this. And so also we have these math functions that I told you about. So sets in math, you can do like unions, you can do intersections, you can do uh, uh, you know many other things. So in this case, if I want to find like the union between odd and even, we'll see that we can union these two sets together, and we'll, it'll have you know the elements from both sets. If I want to have prime intersect the odd set, I can just do primes dot intersection with odds. 
and that'll give us that intersection and same thing with the prime and the evens. So those are the basic functions that you'll see in a set and how to interact with one. So let me go ahead and show you guys a common example. Or actually, first, let me tell you guys why lookup times are faster in sets than arrays and lists. So this is something you'll learn about more later on in 125 and for sure in CS225. But basically, if you want to look at if something is in a list, whether you're doing it or not, under the hood, what it is doing is looping through the list and saying, is this element inside of this list? So you look at every single element until you found the element that you're looking for. In data structures and lists that are very large, that actually takes time, like going through every single element. So if there's something you know, all the way in the middle of a list that is like 3 million elements large, that takes quite a bit of time, quite a bit of computational time. So with sets, I don't want to explain exactly why, because that'll take too long, and that is beyond the scope of this lecture, but you don't have to do that. It is just constant time. You want to find something, it'll tell you right away without having to do any iterating through the data structure. So it's much faster in terms of lookups. And so with that said, let me show you guys a common use case of sets as a result of that functionality. The being able to find things very fast uh, inside of a inside of a data structure without having to actually loop through every single time, uh, whether you're doing it or whether it's happening under the hood. So let's say I have a player uh, a list of players strings NBA players, um, and let's say I want to welcome them, but if I've already seen them, if I've already welcomed them, I want to just say hello again, and so. Sets are very useful in this kind of algorithm. You, you might use this algorithm in a you know, coding interview type question. If you want to keep track of things that you've seen already, the set data structure is very useful. So let's say I want to iterate through the players list and say, um, if I've already seen the player, so if player in scene, then just say hello again to the player. However, if I haven't seen them, add them to the scene list because now I've seen them, and then say hello, or rather welcome to the player. And so if I execute this, you can see what it looks like. You'll see that for the second time that I find someone, I will say hello again. And this is very nice because if we actually stored what we've seen in a list, it would take much longer than it would uh, with a set because of the things that you'll learn later on in 225 that I don't want to cover, but just keep in mind the iterating thing that I told you about. Um, so that is a common use case of sets. Let's go ahead and go through a couple quick Kahoot questions. We are running low on time, but I should we should be able to get through everything. So the question, true or false, sets hold duplicate elements. This should be very self-explanatory. And for the sake of time, I will be cutting it off at 20 seconds. Someone said, sets are just hash sets. Yes, if you know what a hash set is. Um, if not, you'll learn it eventually. Set is basically a dictionary. Yes, we will learn what dictionaries are right after this. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off for the sake of time. So sets hold duplicate elements, this is false. Sets do not hold duplicate elements. They only hold unique values. Uh, next question. We can access elements in sets by index, true or false. Uh, people are, are saying that they disconnected from the Kahoot. That's fine. As long as you answered some questions, you should be good in terms of attendance. Just still follow along. Uh, we might go a little over, but not by too much. I will try my best to keep this within 50 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna actually just cut this off here. Most people have answered. So for, we cannot access elements and sets by indexed because they are unindexed. Sets, elements and sets do not have indices. So you cannot do that. If you wanna access elements inside of them, you can either see if that element is in by saying the in keyword, or you can loop through the values, but you cannot access by index. So next, the dictionary. So dictionaries are another data structure and so in lists, we access elements by referencing indices. But with dictionaries, rather than referencing 
indices, we reference keys. They are key value pairs. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in an example. And they have the same exact qualities as a set in terms of fast lookup times. So if you want to look up if a key is inside of a table, it is very fast, just like the set compared to a list. So let's look at a quick example. And I'll show you guys a common use case of dictionaries as well. So this is the syntax for initializing a dictionary. So here we have our key, which is brand, model, and year, and then our values, which is going to be Ford, Mustang, and the number. Uh, you can have mixed types in terms of what the values are storing. And to initialize one, you would use these curly braces with these uh, colons separating the key and the value. And so how you access values is first, you can have either these square brackets. There are two ways to access values. So if I want to access brand, I would just, you know, say card dict with the uh, square brackets and then the name of the key because we access things in dictionaries by accessing them by key rather than index, which is what you'd see in a list. And so we can also do dot get with the same exact thing. We can say dot get with the key name. And so the difference between these two, dot get and the square brackets, is that if you reference an element that doesn't exist in the dictionary, if you reference a key that doesn't exist, dot get will return none, while the square braces will return a key error. And I'll show you exactly what I mean here. So here, ignore everything down on the bottom here. I want you to direct your attention to none. Up here is me accessing the elements. None is what happens when we do dot get. But if I uncomment this and I access with the square brackets, we will raise a key error. So that is the difference between the two. Uh, use whatever one makes sense at the time. Sometimes you do want that error, and sometimes you want none. Um, so if you want to change values, you can access them just like we did when we printed them out and just update them. So let's say I want to update the values of the brand, model, and year keyword. We can just update them like so and print it out if we would like. So I can show you guys what that looks like. So um, you can see here that if I want to add something to the list, just give it a key that it hasn't seen. So in the original dictionary, mechanics was not a key. But if I want to add a value to it, we can just refer to mechanics and then a list, for example, here of all of the mechanics that my car has seen. And when we print that out, you'll see here that we have the updated list. So this is how we add values and this is how we change values. Um, if we want to loop through the keys, we can just say for key in the dictionary. That'll give us the key. It doesn't matter what the name of the variable here is. I just named it key for clarity. If we want to loop through the values, we just run dot values on the name of the dictionary. And that'll give us all of the values. So here you see all of the keys, mechanics, brand, model, and year. Down here you'll see all of the values that we've added to it, which is the list of mechanics, the model, and the brand and the year. Uh, if we want to loop through both, we can just do dot items, which will give us both the key and the value at the same exact time inside of those tuples that you saw with the enumerate. Um, so we went over that very quickly, but I want to go over an example of how you can, how you can use these uh, dictionaries right after a quick Kahoot question. We will wrap up very soon. Sorry for going a bit over. This is the final Kahoot question. So how can I get the value of the marks key in this dictionary that I have for you? Uh, I went over this very quickly, but this should be fairly self-explanatory as long as you are following along. And I will also cut this off pretty quickly, just like the other two. So get your answers in as soon as you can. We have one more example to go through and then we'll be done for the day. You can select multiple uh, answers here. I'm evil. I'm sorry. I don't know. Like, I'm the worst. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There's multiple answers to this question. The cat's out of the bag. <laughs> um. All right. So, well done to blue and yellow. These are both valid ways of accessing the marks key. 
Uh, two is wrong because, as we said, dictionaries don't have indices like, like what you see in lists. They have keys. You access by key, not by index. And so here we said dot .get and square brackets are both completely fine, except square brackets. If you access an element that is not in the dictionary, a key that doesn't exist, it will raise a key error, while dot .get will give you the value none. So that is it for the Kahoot, and we will have one more um, example of dictionaries. So this is a common use case for dictionaries. Uh, sometimes you want to be able to store information that will be useful in an algorithm for you. So let's say I want to store all of the character counts inside of this string, the counts of every single character that you see. So what I can do is create a dictionary called character counts, and I want my key to be characters, and then the value being all of the times that I've seen that character in the string. And so what we can do is just loop through all of the characters in example, and say that if we've seen character in character counts, then increment the value by one because we have uh, you know another occurrence of that character. And if we haven't seen that, then initialize the value to zero. And so if I print this out, we'll see that after looping through the string, it'll give us some very useful information for every single character that we've seen. If we've, if we, or actually, apologies, this should be one because we've seen it. Uh, let me fix that real quick. Okay, so. We've seen E only one time, so it'll increment it by one. Uh, but for the ones that we've seen more than once, like E, it'll say eight times. It'll store all the character counts from character to integer. And so if I want to, let's say, use this information in a later algorithm, let's say I have a question that says, find me all of the characters that have occurred at least four times in this, in this string. We can go ahead and declare that same kind of character counts dictionary, loop through the string in the same fashion that we had before, and we can say for every character in the example, which is the string, we can go ahead and increment it in the same fashion that we did before. And while we're at it, if we hit a point where after we increment a character count and it reaches four, we've seen four um, instances of the character in that string, we can append that character to the output list, and I will print out what that will give us. So in this example string that I wrote, the characters that have occurred at least four times are E, N, O, and T. Uh, and also, I still have that mistake that I need to solve. So uh, there you go. These are This is the correct answer for that. So uh, hash tables, or rather dictionaries in this case, dictionaries are very useful for storing information in algorithms, and they're very useful for storing data that won't exactly be structured as nicely inside of a list. So that is a common use case. We will give you guys some practice with that in homework. So uh, that is the end of this lecture. Sorry for going five minutes over, it seems. So from here on out, we will be using Python as a tool. And so... Um, what I mean by this is we are not going to spend a whole bunch of time with more Python syntax lectures for all of our future lectures from here, except for the Rust lectures near the end of the semester or in the second half of the semester. We are going to be using Python as a tool. And so what that means is we're not going to spend a whole bunch of time on syntax because syntax is boring. And from here on out, you should be able to, for you know things that you might not know, kind of fill in the gaps yourself. But we have covered quite a bit of Python. This should be a very nice starting point, very nice foundation for you. And we will give you some uh, examples and practice in the homework. So uh, any questions that you guys might have, drop them in the chat. But from here, you guys are free to go. Apologies for going over. People are asking about extra credit. No extra credit. The Kahoot was very easy. And also, I'm not sure if we will actually be offering extra credit in the Kahoot.